we talk about the newborn and events that follow the normal delivery. So you should prepare yourself to receive this new human being. After complete delivery and everything pass smoothly, here you should proceed for the next step. Neonatal examination. What are the goals behind in neonatal examinations? What are the goals behind this neonatal examination? First, assess well-being of the newborn. It is so important for you to assess the well-being because if you feel something going Wrongly, you should correct and you should interfere immediately because newborn never stand hypoxia that may impact the well-being of the newborn. Next, you screen for the general abnormalities, general obvious abnormalities or bad trauma or acquired medical problems. If this is going well, next you should assess the gestational age. Of course, it's appropriate for gestational age and the size of the newborn. When appropriate and have extra time, you should inform or confirm the normality of their child to do parents. When appropriate, demystified and reassure the parent about the common benign variation in the newborn physical examination or behavior. Of course, not all the newborn may exhibit the same physical examination or behavior. Others may divide with quietness. So all of these, all of these considered to be within normal. After that, you should foster early infant parent bonding. Infant parent bonding, of course, the first relationship between the newborn and their parents. Infant parent bonding, it means love the newborn from one side, just from the parents. And the infant himself never accept loving to the parents because it is still immature to accept a such loving process. We have another Bonding may be considered in a large children that we call infant parent attachment. The feeling of this relationship, of course, reciprocal between the infants and parents. But after birth, just we have a bonding, just love from the parent to their newborn. This is important for you to assess the feeling of their family towards the newborn. So start with the physical examination, general appearance, important observe body proportions, the trunk, the extremities, activity, movement, symmetrical of the activity, 
cry and itch quality, skin color, important for you to assess gross abnormalities. Of course, we have gross abnormalities that are so obvious by naked eye, and we have uh, certain hidden abnormalities that should be discovered in next part of examination. Unusual features and sign of respiratory distress, weight, length, and head circumference should be obtained and recorded in the case sheet. So, the skin color of the newborn, of course, may ranking in between these three types of skin color. Cyanosis that result from the deoxygenation, pallor that may indicate a high blood loss or severe anemia in utero or sometimes maybe normal in post-maturity. Jaundice, of course, due to increase the level of bilirubin. So, generally speaking, about the skin color, you should assess the peripheral vascular instability. It may be normal at newborn meeting after birth. So, we can find skin mottling perioral cyanosis, and cyanosis of the hand and feet. This is called acrocyanosis, or cyanosis of the cold parts of the skin. While lips, mucous membrane, nail bed, and tongue should be remain pink. This is a warm area should be pinked. If we have cyanosis all over the body. That's mean your patient in a critical zone. You should interfere immediately. Cracking or discomation of the skin is a normal in the term and post-term infant, but never in a preterm. Term infant may have a downy hair known as a lanoka hair, of course, covering the skin, particularly on the shoulder and about back. This is a normal phenomenon in the term baby. Jaundice in the neonate is first visible on the face. And as the serum level of bellerobin, it progresses caudally to include the rest of the body. Of course, seclera involved in this presentation. Natural saline should be used to inspect the skin for the extent of the jaundice. Keep in mind, most of the newborn develop jaundice that mostly confined to the face, of course, most likely physiological. But if it's reached the soul, definitely this is not physiological, it's abnormal. Next, you should comment on the other Birthmarks, common and visible at birth include flat vascular nevi, flat vascular nevi, as example, salmon batch, nevus, and port wine stain. This slide show acrocyanosis, peripheral cyanosis that we talk about. Peripheral cyanosis, uh, consider normal, especially in cold condition, but never involve the lips, mucous membrane, and bed nail. This is a jaundice. Involve face and the body. Of course, it's so high level of bilirubin. You notice the involvement, the whole face and the upper chest with yellowish seclera. This raise cavernous hemangioma may be present at birth. This is not flat, slightly raised. This 
port wine nearby of course not raised this is a flat one so keep in mind this may be face you in the in your natal examination room Benign rash that may be considered normal in the newborn, erythema toxica, has a flea bite appearance with a scattered erythematous macule that may contain papulopustular centers filled with eosinophil. This rash typically changes distribution from day to day. So, erythema toxica so common to be faced in the newborn period. So, this is uh, erythema toxicum that mostly involve the face. Media are transient, fine, pinpoint, yellow, white papule caused by retained sepum that typically cover the bridge of the nose, chin, and cheeks. Of course, this is considered so common in a newborn period that should be notes. This is Amelia. This is Amelia. Of course, involve most likely the nose. So completely normal phenomena, completely normal phenomena. Neonatal post melanosis consists of a small vesicular pustule that are present at birth and rupture within a few days, leaving transient pigmented macula with scaly border. Of course, this is a neonatal post So common and considered normal. Head and neck. This morning, I shall have neck. The head and face frequently exhibit sequelae of the birth process, including bruises and asymmetries, most resolved spontaneously. Facial features should be carefully inspected for size, placement, and symmetry. So important to palpate the skull to determine the contour, exit of separation, or overriding of sutures and the size of the fontanelles. Important to assess the overlying of the suture. Of course, this is overlying, it's so normal process to facilitate the normal birth, to make the head so small for more smooth birth process. Modeling of the head shape, into elongated or asymmetric contour occur secondary to the intrauterine pressure or force during labor. So important, you may notice the asymmetry of the shape. This is, of course, normal. Kiffel hematoma and caput succedinum, so common in neonatal manifestation. 
Kefal hematoma simply is a bleeding under the pelosium, and the carpet succedum, of course, is the edematous changes to the pressure effect. This is the difference between the carpet succedum and the kefal hematoma. Of course, in the next lectures, we can take more information about this, but look to the difference. Kefal hematoma is bleeding, limited by sutures with normal skin underlying, while the carpet system is considered edematous changes with echemotic spot or cyanosis or the duskness of the skin. Eyes. Of course, the newborn never allowed to open their eyes by force, or even at daylight. So, dining the room light, crawling the exhibit in the examiner hand to lift the baby head off, the mattress may stimulate the baby to open her or his eyes. So, by this maneuver, you can open the eyes and not by force. So what you can see normally in the eyes, conjunctival or secular hemorrhage that resolve with time and usually so benign. This is subconjunctival hemorrhage that considered to be normal. The presence of red reflex excludes the presence of lens opacities like cataract. Of course, this is done by presence of ophthalmoscope, not by naked vision. Up to three months, the eyes normally may appear to be cross intermittently. It's not considered a type of sequence. This is normal up to three months, so don't be worried. Ears should be examined. Latency of the canal should be determined. Malfort or lesset ear may be associated with duterte or renal abnormalities. Of course, we have a lot of syndromes that may be associated with ear deformities, especially lesset ears. Nose. Nose of the newborn should be examined and because these nose breathers, so obstruction of the nasal passage result in respiratory distress, especially of if obstruction bilateral. The mouth should be examined by inspection and palpation. Common minor abnormalities include smooth white epithelial pierce along the gum margin or you can find small white cyst termed Ibisin pierce along the median rough of the heart palate. Important to palpate the oral cavity by your thumb to exclude submucosal pony left of palate, pony cleft of palate, because cleft palate may be so obvious with cleft lip and may we have a submucosal type of cleft palate. So important to assess the peers. This is the peers, example of peers, are the heart palate. And this is another one, are the root near the gum. Neck must be ex hyper extended to inspect adequately for masses that of course mostly relate to the thyroid gland. So goiter, cystic hygroma, brachial cleft cyst and thyroglossal cyst, of course, so obvious in certain newborns. Whipping of the neck, important to be seen, of course, internal syndrome. Chest, 
clavicle are palpated for sign of fractures. In fact, the commonest fracture in the newborn is the clavicle. So always you should feel. Respiratory rate and button and the presence of chest asymmetry, retraction, grunting, and nasal flaring must be determined in some healthy infants. As you know, respiratory rate is age limited. Of course, an increase after birth, up to 40 breaths per minute is normal. More than 50 breaths per minute is considered abnormal. Transient crux may be escorted during the first few hours after birth and is considered normal. And accompanied by a sign of respiratory stress, a normal pattern of pelvic breathing with pauses up to 10 to 15 seconds and accompanied by a bradycardia or change in the color and tone may be observed. Of course, this short period apnea considered normal. As mentioned, if not associated with bradycardia or change in the color or tone, considered normal. Pathological apnea, of course, associated with the bradycardia, change in the color and change in the tone. Card examination, important. Heart sound, a loudest in the left chest. If the loudest sound on the right side, this indicates dextrocardia or dextro position. Dextro position, the heart pushed or pulled by something in the chest. Cystic murmur are commonly heard in the first 24 hours of life, probably because of the closing ductus arteriosus or normal change in the pulmonary vascular resistance. These murmurs usually appear within two days after birth. So if you hear uh, such abnormal finding, you should tell the family that this newborn need further assessment in next days. So presence or absence of the murmur in the newborn not exclude or goes with congenital heart disease. Abdomen, normal is convex and move with respiration. The liver and spleen normally may be palpated. Kidneys also should be examined. The kidney may be palpated in the fingertips, pressing deeply into the lower lateral aspect of the abdomen with oboist hand rested under the baby back, of course, at the level just superior to the iliac crest. So these organs should be kept in mind in every newborn. The guanine area and genitalia should be examined. All the newborn never to be forgotten, these findings should be written and inserted in the case sheet. Femoral pulses should be assessed. Male genital exam should be included, location of the urethral meatus, palpation of the testes. Testes may be antecedent in premature baby. So should be assessed later. Hernia or hydrocele should be assessed. And of course, in the practice training, you should know the difference between hernia and hydrocele. Female genitalia, then it should be certain the presence of urethra and vaginal opening as well as normal size clitoris to exclude ambiguous genitalia. Perforated hymen and vaginal tracia, of course, may be present. 
In normal infant, transient swelling of the levea minora or vaginal discharge, that is mucoid or bloody, that results from the influence of maternal hormones. So most of the families asking about this, you should reassure them about this finding. Anus inspected for patency and placement. Keep in mind, it's a shameful thing for you to discharge a normal newborn with unperforated anus because you may forget to exam the anus. It's a shameful thing when the newborn returns to you with abdominal distension and vomiting due to the anal stenosis or imperforated anus. So one of the important points that should be kept in mind regarding the neonatal examination, the anus. Extremities should be examined. Developmental dysplasia of the hip, so important to be examined consider one of the important screening process in the newborn occurs in one to 1,000 live birth and much more common in girl and breech delivery. Of course, clinically, you may assess the presence of dislocated of the hip by asymmetry in the lower limb length Placement of the medial thigh and gluteal folds or degree of hip flexion should raise the suspicion for unilateral hip dislocation. Of course, bilateral hip dislocation considered to be more difficult because these findings may be not present. We have two maneuver for assessing the developmental displacement of the hip. We have a barrel maneuver that, of course, used to assess the already dislocated hip by hitting the clunk, while the other ortenani process used to dislocatable hip, not dislocated. Dislocatable hip, it means the hip already or susceptible to dislocation if you add extra forces to exit the head of the femur from the scapula. So when you press by thumb on the head of the femur, you may feel the head may get out. This is dislocatable hip. It means the hip ready for dislocation, but not dislocated. Herbs and clumpic palsy is important to assess. And we can talk in the next lecture about these types of the herbs and clumpic palsy. Generally speaking, herbs involve the upper fibers of the brachial plexus, C5, C6, while the clumpic palsy involve the lower brachial plexus, C5, 7, and T1. Neurogenic examination should be examined by the way. So state of the consciousness and the ease with which the infant make transition from waking to the sleeping or fusing to calming, as well as the strength of the cry should be noted. Primitive reflex should be assessed, of course. You take a general idea from these reflexes when you are in the fourth class. Cranial nerve should be assessed well. Gestational age, of course, one of your goal in your natal examination. So change may be determined by the assessing certain physical and neurological character that evolve in predictable and progressive fashion during the later part of gestation. 
So the character of the physical and neuromuscular should be considered and to be obtained in every new pawn. Adding of the new physical and neurological character for each other to assess the final number of gestation. After determining the gestational age, weight, length, and hair circumference should be taken. What we mean by physical criteria of gestational age? Of course, you assess the pinna of the ear, size of the breast tissue, of course, the pinna, recoil of the pinna, size of the breast tissue, lenoco hair, creases of the blunter surface, and genitalia. All of these physical criteria with certain score that should be estimated, of course, in practice session. Neurological criteria of the station age, of course, include posture, square window, arm recoil, complete angle, where scarf sign and heel to ear angle. So, important things we have another ways to assess the gestational age. So menstrual period may be calculated from the last menstrual period up to the birth. Date of conception can help from fetal atrocinography and physical and neurological criteria that we talk. Physical and neuromuscular criteria assessment that assess in table that called Ballard score. Ballard score. This should be explained in the practice session because each of these criteria in need time for examination and explanation. Of course, we are finishing the neonatal examination. So important for you to discover the hidden area. If you have a lot of newborn, and if you have done extra time to take as detailed neonatal examination, you should assess the gestational age, presence or absence of congenital abnormalities, gestational age, and then assess the hidden area, open the mouth for the cleft palate, examine the heart for sight and extra abnormal murmur, examine the anus for imperforation and then examine the back. If you have extra time, you should examine in this way. So after examination, you should take care of this newborn. As a fact, water represents for 94% of the fetal weight. After birth, the weight content reduced to 80% of his weight. Newborn and fluid loss during the first week of life, the extra cell fluid space contract resulting in a large reduction in the body water. This water loss is responsible for about 10% of the weight loss observed, of course, in the term, while the term may lose more, up to 15% of his birth weight. 
Water loss through the evaporation from the skin and from expired air is preferred as an insensible water loss. Water loss through the urine and stool is referred as a sensible water loss. Stool account for every small amount of sensible water loss. So, the reduction of the weight at the end of the first week not considered normal. It's normal process due to this fact that we mentioned. So, this newborn in need for fluid replacement, need for fluid replacement, of course, because of cutting of the umbilical cord. So the baby should depend on himself by help of you. So you should replace the fluid that lost. The fluid replacement may be parenteral fluid if the patient cannot receive oral fluid or enteric fluid. So in case of parenteral fluid, of course, IV line should be inserted or if difficult through the Embolus. So, umbilical vein sometimes used for giving of drugs or fluid. So, in case of parenteral fluid, fluid intake, the terminal phase usually began with 6 to 70 ml per kg on day one, and then increased to 10 to 100. 20 ml per kg by day two to three. Keep in mind, keep in mind, the fluid that should be given in the first day is glucose, saline, dextrose. Never contain electrolyte because the newborn never to be tolerate extra solute because the renal still premature. So, so you should use five to 10% of dextrose. More premature infant may need to start with 7 T to 80 ml per kg on day one and advance gradually to 150 ml per kg per day. So from the slide, you show and notes the need of premature baby more for fluid because the newborn lost more fluid than term. Electrolyte loss and replacement. The newborn of course lost not just the fluid, also that may be lost. What are the important electrolytes that should be replaced? Sodium, potassium, and chloride. So the loss may be through the urine, of course, maybe through the stool. Assuming adequate urine output replacement is begun 24 hours after birth at the following rates. So in the first 24 hours, don't give a such electrolyte. Replace after 24 hours. Sodium, one to three milliequivalent per kg per day. Potassium, one to two milliequivalent per kg per day. Chloride, of course, the same of sodium. Nutritional consideration, so important in a such newborn. Keep in mind, 
the composition of the solution and the root of the depend on the newborn state. The gestational age is so important because term differ from that of premature. Second, general medication general medical condition should be taken in consideration. So well, of course, not tolerate enteric feeding, so continue on IV line. Nutritional consideration can be given according to special nutritional need of the newborn. So important, these factor may limit the type and amount of the flu that be given. Of course, the talk previously mentioned related to the parenteral fluid, parenteral fluid, parenteral fluid that given through the IV line, through the IV line. If the newborn tolerates enteric nutrition, of, of course, through the mouth, you can start. Of course, newborn should be fed at least one to two hours after birth. Don't delay the enteric feeding if the patient whelping for a such feeding. So, term infant can be breastfed or petal fed according to the condition. Of course, the rule of feeding on demand, not according to the schedule. The otherwise healthy preterm infant who is between 34 to 38 weeks should be fed every three hours by breast portal or gavage depending on infant strength and the alertness. So this premature baby may tolerate the oral feeding with extended periods. The preterm infant who is less than 34 weeks does not have a well coordinated suck and swallow and therefore should be fed via the feeding tube. The feeding may be gastric pulse every two, three hours, except infant weighing less than one kg. Should be fed in different way. Continuous gastric feeding is employed in infants who weigh less than one kg, not by pullus, because this infant limited gastric and maybe experience intermittent hypoglycemia and hypoxia when given pullus feeding. So should be given by continuous way. Of course, given in 10 to 20 mil per kg and increase accordingly. Intravenous fluid are needed until feeding provide approximately 120 mil per kg in case of extremely premature or weighing less than one kg. Of course, this newborn may tolerate enteric feeding later on. Intra feeding cessation should be done when this newborn receive through the oral about 120 mil per kg. At that time, you can stop the intravenous line.
شباب موجودين for intake all of the water calories protein and vitamin requirement of the new normal term infant are met by human milk so if there is no contraindication of the oral feeding should start with human milk breastfeeding if we have if we have other quality of breastfeeding we can use portal formula generally kilo calories per os should be within 20 kilo calorie so 20 kilo calorie of per each os of milk os of course equal to 28 mil of milk so 28 or roughly we can say 30 ml of water with one scoop of milk give us about 20 kilocalorie per os. The specific nutritional need of this infant for normal growth are as follow. Normal term infant needs 10, 100 to 120 kilocalories per kg per day to meet basal and growth requirements. These conjugal maintenance requirement of the newborn, 100 to 120 kilocalories per kg. The infant also need about two to three grams per kg of protein for cellular growth, which represents approximately 10% of total daily caloric requirements. Forty of daily calorie requirements should be derived from should be derived from the carbohydrate and the remainder of them the fat. So, 40% from carbohydrate, 2% from the protein, and 50% of fat. Of course, this is in a full-term baby. Preterm have decreased gastric motility and intestinal lactase activity, as well as increased calcium and phosphorus requirement, among other nutritional problems. The initial feeding solution should be dilute whey based formula or a human milk as positive nitrogen balance is achieved. The infant may be advanced to a formula that is high in calcium, phosphorus, and protein, or to supplemental human milk. A formula that gives 24 Calorie per os is reserved for infant whose water intake must be restricted, and infant who cannot tolerate adequate feeding volumes. So, in a usual circumstances, you give a formula that gives us 20 calorie per os. But in certain newborn, especially the preterm, that not tolerate extra fluid intake, we give a concentrated formula, like a, a such formula that give us 24 kilocalorie per os. Special vitamins need? Infant who are fed human milk, may receive multiple vitamin supplementation like A, D, and C. On the small body store and inadequate feeding volume, preterm infants should routinely receive multiple vitamin supplement containing uh, the fat-soluble vitamins A and D and the water-soluble vitamins B and C. In addition, the preterm infant who is less than 36 weeks 
and should receive vitamin E to prevent hemolytic anemia. So, if someone asks you what are the possible causes of hemolytic anemia in a preterm, your answer in a such way, vitamin E may result, deficiency of course, may result in hemolytic anemia. So you should add vitamin E to the fluid and formula that given to the premature. Of course, the special mineral and trace element may be needed by this newborn. Iron, all infants require iron supplementation, which may be obtained via iron fortified formula or through separate supplement. Iron supplementation may be delayed in the preterm infant until enteric feeding are tolerated. So no contraindication to be start with iron early. Because of the increase by availability of the iron in human milk, iron supplementation in turn breast infant may wait the introduction of iron fortified cereal at four months of age. Folk acid needed to be added for DNA produce new cells. Fluoride supplementation probably should not be given to infant younger than six months of age, even when otherwise indicated because the danger of fluorosis. Calcium and phosphorus, the need of growing term infant are met by either commercial formula or human milk owing to the rapid bone growth. So calcium and phosphorus requirement of the preterm infant are greater than of the term and necessitate special fortified formula or supplementation if human milk not, uh, not so enough for a such newborn. So these important mineral should be taken in consideration and should be assessed periodically to replace as such deficiencies. Of course, we have add another special mineral, but the most important iron and calcium beside phosphorus. Of course, breastfeeding in a well-balanced body weight and competent, healthy women not need to be added immediately, but in mildly nourished women, these mineral supplementation consider so important. So these depend on your judgment regarding the newborn to be need or not to be need. Any question? <laughs>